Good afternoon by two minutes all. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Rebecca Harrison, uh, comes to us from UK today, but comes to UK from a little bit uh, his roundabout. Story. Yeah, she graduated with a BA in philosophy from the University of Oklahoma, but earned her PhD in philosophy and also graduate certificate in women, gender, and sexuality from Rice University, working in the clinical ethics track, which is a joint program between Rice University and the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, before coming to UK, Dr. Garrison was assistant professor of medicine and medical ethics at the Baylor College of Medicine, which means she was co-coordinating the ethics program for some large places, Methodist Hospital, Texas Medical Center, which is a big place. It's huge. Yeah. It's bigger than it was when I was there. It's, so. Yes. That's, and, yeah. They're growing. Uh, and, it's, and she was responsible there for aspects both of graduate and undergraduate education. Today at UK, she is a clinical ethics consultant covering all of UK healthcare and also responsible for ethics related to education. So I am very happy uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Rebecca Yarrison. Thank you. Thank you. Again, clapping before my morning talk, everybody clapped at the beginning. And I'm like, wait, wait, see if you like it first. So. Um, so I'm really glad that I was asked to be here today because this is an issue that I've really been struggling with and it started out because I had a lot of these cases clinically. And so I was writing a chart note and I realized I was really struggling to articulate what my issue was in, this cl in these clinical cases and that spawned this kind of whole project. And it really ties into an interest that I have in just questions about the limits of autonomy generally. And so we're going to get into a fair amount of that today too. So. That said, this is the first time I've gotten to present any of this material, so I will very much look forward to the discussion part of the day. So, I don't have a clicker, so I'm gonna be wandering here, and I'm a wanderer, so I can't stand here, so bear with me. Okay, so the first thing I knew, need to do is understand what is this problem. When people hear selective adherence, it's kind of a phrase I kind of coined, trying to explain what's going on. But I think a good way to think of it is like a menu. When we think about a treatment plan and we present a treatment plan to a patient, there are a couple different ways we can think of this. Now, I don't think we think of it consciously this way. I just think this is a helpful framework for understanding this problem. So one way we can think of it is kind of as a, what I call, what's a, like a prefix menu. How many people know what that is? Have kind of an idea? So a prefix menu, as I learned, um, by dear experience in Italy when I told a waiter that I wanted to make substitutions on the menu and he put me in my place rather quickly. A prefix menu is a menu where they do not allow, they might have several courses listed and they do not allow substitutions, changes. They say you get this food, this is the price and you can't say, oh, could I have fries instead? No, no, that is verboten, absolutely. The a la carte menu, on the other hand, is the one that we're mostly familiar with. You go, you get a menu, there are all these choices for appetizers, all these choices for soups, all these choices for other things, and you get to pick and choose until you make the meal that you want to make. So I think this is one way to think about when we present a treatment plan. We can think of it as a prefix menu, where we say this is your plan. As a unit, do you accept or refuse this plan? Or we can think of plants as an a la carte menu, where we say there are items on the list, items on the menu, and maybe you accept some, refuse others, and then you end up with whatever plan comes after you've accepted and refused the different elements of the particular treatment plan or a series of treatment plans. So, yeah. So, so when I think about this, I think of this kind of two ways. If we think about these as a la carte menus, there are kind of two ways we can go with this. And I want to actually start out by distinguishing between selective adherence and non-adherence. Selective adherence is this idea that when we treat, the, treat it as an a la carte menu, in one of these two ways that I'll get to here in a second, when we treat it as an a la carte menu, um, patient, it's not that patients are not complying with us, it's not like we said, here's the plan, and they're just not following it. Although I will say, when I encounter this clinically, this is how most people describe it. They say, oh, this patient is non-compliant. 
Sometimes there are issues in noncompliance, and those might have to do with social determinants of health, you know, barriers to care, things like that. Um, it may just have to do with, eh, I'm not doing that, I don't feel it, whatever. But there are also situations where a patient consciously selects or refuses different elements of the treatment plan, and those are the ones I want to isolate. So there are two different ways they can kind of do this. The first one, I was actually sat here, try, worked on this slide forever because I kept putting these bullet points in that did not explain it very well. And I'm a visual person, so I struggle with that anyway. But then I came up with graphics. <laughs> and as a philosopher, the world of graphics is an amazing and terrifying place. <laughs> However, in this case, I think it works. And I was so proud of this slide, I turned to my office mate and said, look, graphics. So. Anyway, so there are two different types of selective adherence. The first kind is this idea of selective refusal. This is where we hand a patient, we say, hey, here's the treatment that we want to do. You say your goal is to get better and go home. Here's what you need to do to do that. And when we have selective refusal, the patient says, okay, but I'm not going to do, you say I need to do A, B, and C, I'm not doing C. The other kind is where we say, you know, there are a couple different options we have here. You have plan A with A, B, and C. Plan B with one, two, and three. And the patient says, okay, that's fine. Um, I would like to do A, two, and part of three. And so what they do is they take elements from different treatment plans and kind of pull them together. So these are plans, these are all treatments that have been offered, and yet they pick and choose different elements of it to come up with a plan that's kind of not a whole plan that was offered to them. That's a lot of talking, what's it look like? <laughs> I'm all about examples. So some examples of this are, and these are all patients that I have actually seen, these are all cases that come before us. Uh, one of them is a patient with burns over 50% of his body, and every time I talked to him, he said he wanted to recover, go home to his children. And yet, the reason I was involved is he kept refusing his dressing changes, which if you have burns over 50% of your body and you refuse your dressing changes, sepsis is soon to follow, probably death. Um, he was refusing because he said it was painful for him and he wanted us to do them under general anesthesia, which was not going to happen. Um, we also have, this is actually, um, I've had lots of patients who do this. So a patient with total dysphagia, so they have, massive swallowing problems. They're not able to swallow without some of the food going into their lungs. What this does is it sets them up for very bad things. <laughs> um, once you get food in your lungs, you end up with, um, I just dropped the word, aspiration, yes. You aspirate, I don't know why I just dropped that word, that's the one I usually don't drop. So aspiration, you can code, you can crash, you could get aspiration pneumonia, have to go to the ICU. There are all kinds of horrible things that can happen. But he also wants to be full code, get better, go home. So this patient's saying, I wanna get better and go home and do these things that are gonna keep me from getting better and going home. There are also, and this is fairly common, patients who are listed for transplant of some kind, they say, I'm not gonna do physical therapy, which is kind of a requirement of getting a transplant. Um, things like that, where they just say, I'm, I don't want to do that physical therapy, I don't want to do that treatment regimen, I don't want to do these kind of things that I need to achieve that goal. So those are what these cases can present as. Now, you may be asking, why isn't this a problem of decisional capacity? Because when you think about capacity, everybody, you are criteria. The criteria for determining capacity, the patient has to be able to understand intellectually what's going on. They have to be able to appreciate that it applies to them and how it applies to them. They have to be able to reason from uh, their information, their goals and their values to a solution. And they have to be able to express a choice. Now sometimes when you look at this, people say, look, I don't think that patient has capacity. And truthfully, a lot of the patients in these cases, sometimes they don't. That's possible, that's something we always have to check. However, there are reasons that a patient might still make these choices and yet still have capacity. So patients, they may be trying to balance competing goals. When we talk about what's the patient's goal, in a sense, we're making a mistake because patients often have lots of different goals. So I may want to go home. I may want to get better and go home. I may want to be pain-free. I may want to, um, 
be here as little as possible. I may want to, you know, so there are all kinds of things that could happen. And often those goals might be in conflict. Uh, they may also understand the concerns about reduced efficacy. Say, look, you put this, this plan that you've kind of come up with here, this isn't necessarily going to work for you. Yeah, there's still a chance it'll work, but this is not very effective. They might say, okay, I get that, but I'm going to accept that risk. I had a patient who had dysphagia. It wasn't 100%, um, but he was at pretty high risk of aspiration. And when I went to talk to him, I said, look, you've got a situation here where you say you want to get better and go home. You want us to rescue you if you crash, but you're setting yourself up to crash. And this isn't just about living or dying. There's all kinds of morbidity that comes with coding. And he looks at me and he says, I'm going to accept that risk. We say, we don't want to accept it on your behalf, which was what the tension was. But for him, he said, I'm willing to accept that risk. I will say that was a very frustrating case for a lot of people involved. Um, it may also not be a matter of reason, but a matter of willpower. It may be that we recognize that we ought to do something. I recognize that I ought to exercise so that I can lose weight, achieve lots of goals I have, including buying that really cute pair of pants I saw in the window. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm sufficiently motivated to do those things. I may know that I have to do that to achieve a goal I have, but I'm like, uh, not today. It hurts. I'm really tired. I've recently been a patient myself. I'm going to tell you sometimes that whole I'm too tired to do anything is a real thing. So sometimes it's not just, and I say willpower not as a judgmental term, but just mostly as the idea that sometimes we're just not feeling it. And so we're just not going to do it right now. Okay. okay. So what's the issue here? So we have our patients who are essentially doing this selective adherence in one of two ways. Because patients have a legal and moral right to participate in their own care and accept or refuse treatment according to their own values, beliefs, and goals. This is simply the rights statement version of the principle of respect for autonomy. This means that, and frankly, our right to refuse treatment is as close to an absolute right as I think we get in medicine. And the team has offered these treatments. They've said, we can treat you in these ways. And the patient has accepted part of the treatment and refused part of the treatment. So what's the problem? The problem is that the resulting treatment, the reason that physicians call me in distress when these cases come up, or nurses, or social workers, or PAs, or whoever, they call me in distress because they're in a situation where, OK, they've refused all of these things to the point where the plan that we have left isn't going to help them, but I don't know what else I can do. I feel like I have to provide those things that I offered, except for the ones they refused. But I don't think this overall plan is in any way helpful to the patient. And so the concern is that, look, we could harm the patient. It could result in a lot of greater resource usage, length of stay. Patients who don't have efficient care plans tend to stay in the hospital much longer. And it can be challenging to the integrity of the healthcare professionals who say, look, I got into medicine and practice to the highest intellectual moral standards. I came here to help people. And this person is saying, eh, help me a little bit, but not a lot. Or I know a way I can help that person, and they want me to do some of it, but not all of it. And they feel kind of pulled in to be complicit in this ineffective plan. So should a healthcare professional be required to provide a treatment that is inefficient, less likely to be effective, carries higher risk than the standard of care? Oh, there's the thing. That's of care as a matter of respect for the patient's autonomous choice. Or, to put it another way, I have another way to put it. Um, the question here is about the limits of autonomous choice. At what point can we limit the, uh, the, our respect for that person's autonomy to the point where we say, I'm sorry, no, I know you chose those things or refuse those things, but we can't do that. So, so how do we answer that question? It's actually really difficult. But what we have to do is we have to do some philosophy. Who's with me on the philosophy? Let's go. All right. 
you really have to check because sometimes people are like, ooh, philosophy, what do you, how much philosophy? So. We'll start out with some more recent stuff, so it'll be a little easier. Who here has heard of Tom Beecham? Beecham and Childress. A few of you, most of you, some of you. So Beecham is well known for his four principles, he and Childress writing together, are well known for their four principles approach to healthcare ethics, which whatever I may think about it personally, has quite become the canon. So when we teach medical ethics to medical students, doctors, nurses, anyone, what we do is we say there are four principles in medical ethics that you need to follow. Respect for autonomy, uh, promoting beneficence, preventing non-maleficence, or well, promoting beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So those are our four principles. There's been some discussion so initially, Beecham and Childers, when they created this, they say, okay, we got our four principles. None of them, they're not rank ordered. None is more important than another. But over time, we've kind of, as much as I may think this is a bastardization of autonomy generally, we've bastardized it even farther. Because now we look at this and instead of saying, you know, going with what they say about this, they, instead of saying, look, it's one among four principles, they balance each other out, we basically said respect for autonomy is the most important principle. And so when you go and you talk to physicians, they actually feel, physicians, nurses, anyone, they actually feel like, well, it's the patient's choice. I don't have a say in the matter. So we've really given a lot of importance to this idea of autonomy. So the question is, what is it? So Beecham says, in moral philosophy, autonomy refers to personal self-governance. Personal rule of the self by adequate understanding while remaining free from controlling interferences by others and from personal limitations that prevent choice. So as long as you understand what's going on, nobody's going to constrain you. You can make choices about your life, whatever you want. It's your values, your beliefs, your goals. Autonomy, in the italics or in the original, means freedom from external constraint and the presence of critical mental capacities such as understanding, intending, and voluntary decision making. The autonomous individual acts freely in accordance with a self-chosen plan. Where does he get this idea? So it's all fine and good to say this is something and it's important, but in philosophy we have to ask, where did that come from? What exact, what is my reason for believing that or agreeing to it? For each and each other, they say the source of the principle of respect for autonomy and all the principles really is something called the common morality. They say that we all share a common morality that's really a set of rules, guidelines, things like that, that over time and through history, we've recognized that they keep life from being nasty, brutish, and short to mix with Hobbes, to bring Hobbes into it. They said we all kind of come to this social agreement that if we do these things, if we help people, if we kind of leave people alone to their own devices, if we you know, give them autonomy, if we are beneficent, if we respect justice, all these things, society just seems to go better. <coughs> so this is very pragmatic. This isn't something saying I have this theoretical view of whatever, this is actually what we call pre-theoretical. Because the idea is this isn't some overarching theory that underlies this. They're saying, hey, unless you want to call common morality a theory in itself. I saw you making that face, so I'm going <laughs> to... No, that's good. Feedback. <laughs> um, so it's actually pretty theoretical because they're not saying we don't have a theory really as to why this is good. It just seems to work. But they've also pulled a lot of the stuff from history, from previous like social, political philosophy, ethics, other thinkers in history. They said people have kind of worked this out. Everybody kind of agrees on this. Let's go with it. But since he's pulling things from history, I kind of have to go back to history myself, and we're going to talk about two thinkers that have talked a lot about autonomy. Now, I will say, um, I feel a little bit scandalous, because I think if I walked into a room of philosophers and said, I'm doing one slide on Kant, <laughs> I'm fairly certain that there would be some <gasps> flustered, I don't know. I feel a little somewhere between scandalous and brave, maybe. Yeah, so I'm going to try to sum up Kant's theory of autonomy in one slide. Very exciting. <laughs> you can tell who's tried to do this before by the snickering. Yes, one slide. 
So for Kant, human beings are all possessors. They have a faculty, an ability to act in accordance with a, con their, a conception of the law. He calls this faculty a will. So we all have this ability to recognize what he calls some conception of law, to be constrained by rules, things like that. For Kant, what these rules consist of, he says, our will, this ability, this faculty, recognizes rational and it recognizes reason and rational laws. So for Kant, he understands rational laws. He understands them as like, kind of, I know I'm playing fast and loose with this, but like, pre, like scientific precepts or mathematical precepts. Like, just because we don't have to have two things and two things to know that that makes four things. We don't have to go through that. We can just know by understanding what two and two mean, we can understand that two plus two is four. For Kant, grasping reason happens in kind of the same way. Like I said, I know I'm playing fast and loose with this, but stay with me. So for Kant, he says that our autonomy is grounded in the fact that all of us are beings that possess this rational will. We can all recognize reason. We can all, therefore, recognize the laws of reason and give that law unto ourselves. For Kant, it's very important that this comes from ourselves and not externally. So it's not a government giving us morality. It's not God giving us morality. He's an enlightenment thinker. He's all about reason. He's, you know, reason, yay. And for Kant, we're always going to be struggling against, like, desires. And he needs reason to win. He's bet the farm on reason here. So because we are autonomous agents grounded we, because we possess a rational will, as such, we are completely self-legislating. Since we all have this will that can give our laws unto ourselves, I can't come and tell you what to do because you have your own little self-legislating will. So all we're constrained by is the a priori, which just means before we have experience, the laws of rational willing. Now one of these is, you may have heard of, the categorical imperative that governs moral action. But he has another kind of imperative, and it's the one I think that's important for today, and that's the hypothetical imperative. And that's the goal-oriented one. That one just says, if you have a particular goal, X, let's say, you have to do those things if you're actually pursuing X. If you want X to happen, then you should do all those things that make X happen. So who wills the end, wills so far as reason has decisive influence on his actions. Also the means which are indispensable, necessary, and in his power. So it's basically like if you want to do something, if you want to get better and go home, and it takes A, B, and C to do that, then you should be rationally accepting of A, B, and C. So this is a law of reason, that if we do not act in accordance with it, we're not acting autonomously. So, okay. So that's Kant. Now, Kant has a lot of theoretical baggage that you really have to buy into to follow him. But so does Mill. This isn't necessarily the best picture. I'm not really sure what that thing is over his eye, but he looked so serious. I like this one. So, Mill thinks very differently from Kant. Mill says, look, liberty, he doesn't really use the word autonomy, he uses liberty, is grounded in the principle of utility. So you guys may have heard of this, right? This is probably going to sound a little bit familiar, even if you haven't done your philosophy. The principle of utility is that one should do that which brings about the greatest balance of happiness over unhappiness while equally considering the interests of everyone involved. So greatest happiness principle, we need to make the world the happiest place that we can. So for, for Mill, he says the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Because remember, we're thinking about the interests of everyone. On Mill, everyone counts equally. Similarly to Kant, who said, look, we all are our own self-legislating entities. So the only, so prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. The only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. And the part which merely concerns itself, his independence is of right absolute. So Mill's idea, and I realize for any philosophers in the room that Mill's grounding of this liberty on the principle of utility is kind of on shaky ground. 
There have been many, many, many volumes written about why that's on shaky ground. But let's just kind of take him at his word for a minute. I know, it hurts. Ow, I'm a flat start. I'm taking somebody at their word. It hurts. Um, we cringe a little bit. We're like, no, we have to examine that. But let's grant for the sake of argument that we can actually do this grounding. The idea here is that what makes people the happiest overall is if they can do, they can make their own life plan and follow through on it. However, because we're considering everyone equally, we recognize in interactions with others, there are things that we may have an obligation to do or be compelled to do, or things like that. So, and these aren't trivial things either. This isn't just, I have to refrain from hitting you in the face. This is, Mill actually says in On Liberty that you can be compelled to uh, contribute to the mutual defense of society. So conscription would not be, you know, Mill would say, well, I mean, he might quibble with how it's done, but ultimately, yeah, you're in for that. Um, other things, if somebody is drowning, you can't ignore them, you have to save them. So there are all kinds of things that this ends up constraining you to do or to not do. So not only can you not hurt other people, but we have special obligations to other people in our interactions with them. Okay. So what's this mean? So you're like, okay, that's all well and good. We talked about some philosopher guys. So what does that mean for us in this issue with selective adherence? Well, the thing I want to point out with this, this is actually a big, long, circumnavigating way of pointing this out, is to say, okay, for Kant, what are the limits to Kantian autonomy? We have to follow the laws of uh, rationality, the laws of rational willing, he calls it. So actions that are governed by desire rather than reason are not autonomous actions. Actions that are not self-legislated, that come from other people, he actually has a word for it, Heteronomous, heter, heter, heteronom. Kant scholars, what's that word? Nobody? Okay, I'm gonna make up something. I'm gonna call it heteronomous. I don't know. I struggle with that word. Anyway, so they're not self legislated. So for Kant, if we are self legislating, we have to follow the rules we give ourselves. We might not, because we're fallible creatures. But, we ought to, and we know we ought to, and when we don't, we're just not being rational. And for Kant, if you're not being rational, you just, I don't even know what you're doing. So, <laughs> so for Mill, we have the violations, so what are the limits for Mill? Anytime we violate the principle of utility and in interactions with others, or if we hurt other people, if we don't contribute to defense, if we don't do those things that we have an obligation to do simply in light of the fact that we're interacting with others and we're governed by the principle of utility, which is we're trying to bring about a lot of happiness. So compelled to aid in societal projects, Mill would support taxation, Mill would support, like I said, conscription, Mill would support all kinds of different things that make society as a whole better. And he would support making you contribute to them. So. So what about Beecham? This is where I start to have some problems. What are the limits to autonomous choice under Beecham? Well, because he doesn't really give us a grounding except for this pragmatic grounding, and there isn't really a theoretical one, and his concept of autonomy is strong on external constraints, but not internal constraints. The way he conceptualizes autonomy, so it basically, as I said earlier, it's look, as long as you are free from external constraint and you have your understanding, you have capacity, you, could, you can have whatever goals, values, beliefs that you want and accept or refuse things accordingly. But I'm not clear where the limits to autonomy come in. If we are going to operate on a principalist framework that doesn't have these theoretical limitations, what are our limitations? That's why I'm not really sure. Now, I'm sure if you talk to Beecham and Childress, to be perfectly fair to them, they would say, that's why we have these other principles, right? We have beneficence, we have non-maleficence. I like to combine them together because it doesn't make sense to me to talk about you know, promoting the good of someone but not harming them separately. Let's talk about a risk-benefit analysis because it's very rare. Like We can't really do anything in medicine that doesn't have a risk of harm, right? 
I actually can't think of anything that we could do. Like even a flu shot, it could hurt, it could bruise, it could whatever. My flu shot really hurt because they have the pharmacy students practice on all of us employees. But, yeah, when you go get your free sh flu shot at UK, you hope for the nursing students. But I went on pharmacy student day. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, shh, don't tell them I said that. No, they're actually fine. It just hurt for a while. <laughs> So they would say something like, it's possibly constrained by other principles, but when you think about beneficence, who is, you say, look, we want to promote somebody's best interest. But who decides what's in their best interest? The person, the patient. And so we're in a situation where the patient, except for justice, the patient has a big say. Their goals, values, and beliefs are directing a lot of what happens in those other principles. So I'm not really sure where we're going to get our constraints out of principalism. But let's say a little more about that. We do recognize that there are constraints. There are lots of things we can't do in medicine. I mean, people, we get into these involvement with like medical futility cases, things like that, and they say, oh, well, the patient always gets what they want. I say, no, that's not true. There are plenty of times the patient doesn't get what they want. We don't give antibiotics for a viral infection, I hope. hope. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> that one might be more aspirational than actual. Um, we don't let people walk into an emergency room treated as a Taco Bell and order 50 Percocets. Right? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's just kind of looking at me like, huh? I'm like, no, really? <laughs> Maybe I need to um, get bus passes to Louisville for some of our friends. Um, <laughs> but, and we also don't have like transplant on demand. Even if you are, are totally indicated for transplant, you're cleared, you're on the list, just because you want one doesn't get you one. Because we just don't have enough, say, kidneys to go around. So how do we justify this? This is where it starts getting weird, because when you ask somebody how we justify these things, we say what's called physiological futility. That just means that whatever you're doing, whatever intervention you're proposing, is completely unable to achieve the goal. Not unlikely, not inefficiently, not whatever, it's just not possible. Amputating someone's foot will not cure their ear infection, right? Um, antibiotics for a viral infection, physiologically futile. Wrong mechanism. Unless we're going to talk about placebo effect, but let's box that. Um, we also have risk of harm with no potential for benefit. That's a reason. That's kind of goes hand in hand with physiological futility, but I think there are some cases we could think that aren't physiologically futile, but there's a risk of harm and there's no benefit. So what about imminent demise futility? I'm pulling a Halevi and Brody's terminology on this, and they talk about different types of futility. Imminent demise is just that patient's going to die really soon anyway. So a lot of times when people talk about the medical futility kind of cases, they're talking about something like medical dem imminent demise futility, where it's just no matter what we do, the patient's going to die really soon. We might be able to who, kick that out a day or two maybe, but they're going to die soon anyway. We try to justify, I put this question mark here, because there are lots and lots of arguments about this idea of whether or not we can unilaterally make a patient DNR, for example, um, unilaterally decide to put them on comfort care, things like that. So I'm not sure that we really accept this as a justification for what we do. The only other ju justification is this idea of distributive justice, which comes up mostly in the transplant world, where they really do have a very blindingly obvious um, scarcity of resources. Where they say, look, some people, we're just, no matter how much they want it and how much it might help them, we're still not going to give it to them. Because, for example, maybe they can't afford their meds afterwards. They can't afford anti-rejection meds. Or um, they need lots of work. They still have, um, Patients who have cancer, for example, we don't give transplants to. So there are some reasons. What are the justifications? I'm actually a little bit touchy about this because I don't know where the justifications for these things come from if we are using a principalist framework. But that's never stopped me before. And so I would like to actually propose another one. And when I started thinking about selective adherence problems, and I went back to the idea of Kantian autonomy, Millian autonomy, I started thinking about what else might justify a limit to autonomy 
Because these things, just as an intuition, we shouldn't have to provide a treatment that just flat doesn't make sense. And so when I was writing a chart note and realized that I could not write in the chart, this just flat doesn't make sense, I tried to come up with what am I trying to articulate here? And that's where a lot of this came from. So I came up with this idea about what about the idea of medical incoherence? And this seemed to me, I'm like, oh, this is a really good word. I can write that in a chart. And it looks really, you know, special and experty and all kinds of stuff. But then when I tried to articulate it to someone, I got into a lot of trouble. So I've spent a lot of time working on articulating this idea. So let's talk about it. So the way I'm defining for now, medical coherence is a treatment plan that is medically coherent when it both makes A, logical sense, and B, is medically reasonable as a means to an end. Sound good. Now, we need to unpack this idea of what exactly we mean by logical sense and what we mean by medically reasonable. Because if I could just slap this up here and be done at the end of the day, that'd be awesome. But I can't. Because we don't know exactly. Somebody could come and say, OK, what exactly do you mean by logical sense? What do you mean by medically reasonable? What counts as that? But first, I want to talk about a justification, since I've been harping so much on this idea of justification. Well, if I was a mill person, I could say, look, we can justify this by saying an individual cannot compel another to act against his conscience or, integrity, in conscience or integrity. I may have my beliefs, values, goals. I may want to structure my life in a certain way. And I can do that entirely when it doesn't interact with others for mill. But medical, in the medical world, there's a whole lot of interaction. You interact with so many different people in the provision of medical care. Does the patient's desire somehow to live their life a certain way and structure their life in this way and get this treatment plan that may or may not work, can that person then compel me, the physician, the nurse, the social worker, all these other people to go along with it? And I would say, Mill, like, these guys aren't clinical ethicists. I've never seen a clinical analysis from either of them. So I'm taking a little bit of liberties here, and I would say probably not. Kant, this is actually a little bit easier. Kant would just look at me and say, to will the ends but not means and to will against one's own goals are both contrary to the laws of rational willing. Therefore, we simply cannot accept this behavior. It's irrational. But principalism, like, uh, how would we justify it under that? This is the same problem we have justifying any kind of limit on autonomy under principalism. <coughs> But I pulled up a couple of pragmatic reasons. So I actually don't stop at form principles. When I teach this, I teach six-ish. One of which is physician integrity. And part of that is professional obligation. The others are virtues, by the way. Um, I tack virtues on as an actual principle unto itself, and there are like six or seven of those. So with pr principalism, physician integrity is the idea that we physicians, nurses, doctors, I should probably say practitioner integrity, it's the idea that we want to practice the highest intellectual and moral standards. And when we are not providing even the standard of care, when we're not providing things, when we know we can do better and we're not doing it, that violates our integrity. There's also an argument from stewardship of resources, concerns about justice, because the longer your length of stay is, if you end up bouncing into the ICU, so my patient with dysphagia who decides to eat, <laughs> I did have one, I was telling Dr. Hansen about the patient I had. She had dysphagia and she insisted on drinking, and, but she wanted more than anything was Diet Sprite. And so we called for a capacity assessment because it was Diet Sprite and not a cheeseburger or something. It's like, if you're gonna lay your life on the line, why Diet Sprite? <laughs> it's like, come on, milkshake at least, come on. And she's like, no, I just want my Diet Sprite. And she's like, I'm willing to be DNR for a Diet Sprite. <laughs> Like regular Sprite? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I, don't, I, I really don't mean to make fun of her. Like, I just, we all had trouble wrapping our head around this one. Turns out she just, she had capacity. She just really liked Diet Sprite. So, so we have these stewardship resources because if you have, if you aspirate then, you end up in the ICU. You take an ICU bed. All of these things that could have been preventable had you followed the plan to achieve your goals. And also, plans that are illogical or unreasonable are also likely, unlikely to have a favorable risk-benefit ratio. If we're not 
likely to achieve our benefit, lots of risk, aspirating, it's really hard to justify in a risk-benefit ratio. So, a little more, what's this look like? So if something's medically incoherent, when I get a phone call, what do I hear? When we hear something that's unreasonable, what we mean when you hear is, we're just setting this patient up for failure. Or if it's illogical, that plan doesn't make any medical sense if she wants to meet her goals. If she wants to go home, she's not going to do it doing what she's doing. I actually like some of the Kantian language. Now, I'm, I don't want to bring all his baggage in. I just want to kind of use this language. Um, Kant would say, because I actually think this is really helpful language. If you want to talk about anything irrational or unreasonable, Kant's probably got language for it. So for unreasonable, when I say unreasonable, what I mean is the treatment plan leads to the patient willing against his or her, her own goals. So what that means is I will that I want to go home. So I am going to work toward that end. But I'm also willing these other things, eating and whatever, that are contrary to that end. So I'm both cheering for myself and setting myself back. That's a contradiction. It kind of vaguely patterns the contradiction of will in the categorical imperative for anyone who's interested in that. But the idea is you're basically saying, look, I want this, and I'm going to do everything in my power to thwart myself from getting that. So it's just, it doesn't make sense. It's unreasonable. Illogical, it's the patient is willing the ends without willing the means. And we talked about that a little bit. You're saying, look, you want to get to here, but you're not doing anything to get, to, you're, what you've got set up here is not going to get you there. So why are we even doing all this stuff that's set up? So, okay. A few more thoughts, um, things I had to clear up. So medical coherence is a threshold concept. It means that a plan may be more or less effective. Um, patients can choose rationally less effective plans. Suppose they're choosing between like medicine and surgery and they say, you know, I don't want to do the surgery because I have this higher risk of surgical complications, so I'm going to do the medicine plan even though it would be less effective at solving my problem. That's actually, you know, okay, that makes sense because if they choose the medical plan, it is itself coherent. Um, this isn't really about judging the goals that somebody has. It's about ju judging the means they choose to get there. So we're not saying that's an unreasonable goal. You're, you know, whatever. We're just saying that you're not going to get there from here, going that path. So whether the threshold is crossed or not, I wish I had a flowchart. I wish I had a bright line where I could say if it's 10% effective or less than 10% effective, it's incoherent. I, I don't. Sorry, guys. It's a clinical judgment. Sometimes we're just going to have to do that. The context matters. Context always matters in ethics. So. Um, not all instances of non-adherence render the plan incoherent. Just because a type 2 diabetic eats a cupcake doesn't make that whole plan that they're going through incoherent. Um, they're not following their diet. It's incoherent. It doesn't, it's not going to work now. Not necessarily. We all have lapses. Um, a patient who's on, for example, a, a vancomycin regimen, oral vanc regimen, may decide not to take probiotics. Oral vanc, for those of you who maybe don't know, it goes straight into your gut and it kills all the bacteria in your gut. And if you don't take probiotics, you can be a little uncomfortable periodically. It's actually just better for you to take the probiotics to replace the good bacteria in your gut. It doesn't mean that whatever you're trying to kill with the oral vanc isn't going to die. And so your plan can still be coherent. It just might not be as pleasant. So. Um, it's also the plan need not be physiologically futile in order to be considered illogical. The idea here is when people have physiological futility, we've already kind of ruled that out. This is where we're getting in all those things that aren't futile, but sure don't make sense. They're probably not going to work. It's really unlikely. It could happen. Maybe that person will never aspirate. Maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> but, um, and finally, medical coherence is related to concerns about harms and benefits. But I'm not making, when I'm saying that something's incoherent, I'm not saying it could be harmful. This is actually a logical argument about means to the end. This isn't saying, oh, it's too harmful, or oh, there's no benefit. It's not an argument that's saying the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence outweigh autonomy. No, this is a logical claim. So. So what's this all look like clinically? You're like, okay, that's all fine and good. Let's do a case. 
So a case. This is a real case. This is my patient. She's fun to talk to. I actually really like this patient a lot, even though she was very frustrating for the team. So she's 32 years old. Um, she has an 18-year history of paraplegia from a motor vehicle accident. She has an ileostomy, colostomy, so all of her functions of um, urinating and defecating are into bags, basically. Um, and she has a PEG tube, so she gets fed through her tube. She's been receiving IV antibiotics through a central venous catheter, so a big line that goes like right here, right Kyle, it's like here, I want to say here. Um, but they pulled it because it was infection. Why was it infected? Well, she's got a lot of infections. She came in with decubitus ulcers and we found her to have sepsis, polymicrobial bacteremia, endocarditis, not related to drug use by the way, incidentally, she was just that infected. Uh, fungi, fungemia, decubitus ulcer, and she was not a surgical candidate to fix the endocarditis or the um, uh, decubitus ulcers to debride them because she was so infected and had so much sepsis and they just said we're not touching her. She does have decisional capacity and is actually quite lovely to talk to and extremely articulate in why she wants things and does not want others. And she wants to go home. She wants to get better and go home to what she's been doing, go home to her parents. She has intermittently refused antibiotics, approximately one third of the doses, and she will not allow a new CVC to be placed, but she accepts all other treatment. She wants to get better, she wants to go home. The reason she's refusing these things is, first of all, she, <laughs> which I thought was actually a very sensible thing to say, because when she said it to me, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, she said, well, if the site's infected, why is putting a new one, if there's all this infection, if you put in a new CVC, it's just going to get infected. So why should I go through that just to get another one and get it pulled? I'm like, huh, yeah, good question. Um, but she was refusing the CVC, which we needed to give her the IV antibiotics. She was also, and for some reason, I forget why, but we couldn't put him through the peg. Um, I don't remember why. Clearly, I'm not an MD. You can tell that when I'm kind of like, eh, there was a tube, but we couldn't use it. Um, but without the antibiotics, she is very unlikely to recover sufficiently to discharge. If she doesn't get her antibiotics, all of these things, not that one, and not that one, but these things are not gonna get any better, and she's not gonna be able to go home. So, what do we do? We have a patient who we say, your plan to get better and go home includes these antibiotics. We had her on orals, which are less effective, but she was taking them after the, we pulled the CVC. <coughs> Excuse me. And, but she didn't like swallow. She said that the oral antibiotics made her sick. So we gave her some pretty high powered anti-nausea meds and she still felt that they made her sick. So she would intermittently refuse taking the antibiotics. And intermittent antibiotic regimens are <laughs> bad, <laughs> ineffective. I'm hearing all the right words, yes. Problematic, yes. Yes, bad juju. <laughs> so, how do we go about this? Thinking about this idea of medical coherence, what do we ask? So we kind of ask ourselves three questions. <clears throat> the first one is, is the overall treatment plan medically coherent without the refused elements? In this case, no. We're not gonna cure bacter bacterial problems without some kind of antibiotics especially not someone who's so colonized as she is. Can we come up with a different plan that's coherent, that she'll accept, that will still accomplish those goals? In this case, no. She was refusing all antibiotics. It wasn't just a specific one. We couldn't just change out the antibiotics. And three, because medical coherence isn't the entire picture, we can't pretend that it is, does refusing the treatment signif significantly increase the risk of harm to the patient and change the risk-benefit analysis? Yes she could die. If she doesn't get treatment for these infections, more bad juju. She could die, she could end up in the ICU, she could end up, in, in which case she will get her central venous catheter, <laughs> she ends up in the ICU. So, what do we do with that? So we go back to the original question in the title, our treatment plans a la carte. My answer to that is helpfully, sometimes. <laughs> When are they? They're all a cart when we could refuse something or change something out that does not affect the coherence of the plan. <clears throat> they are not a la carte when treating them as such 
affects the coherence, makes a plan incoherent. So what does this mean for Mrs. Smith? Ms. Smith, it means she has a right to refuse specific treatments, but not to pick and choose among the elements of a treatment plan or different treatment plans in a way that renders them incoherent. If her refusals result in the plan being medically incoherent, the team is under no obligation to provide and actually should not offer a plan of care that is incoherent. So when she starts refusing things to the point where that's not coherent, we say, okay, we need to abandon that plan. Let's talk about what that means. So what does that look like? We should have a conversation with Ms. Smith where we discuss her overall goals. We say, what are you trying to achieve? What are the important things? And I have goals on here with an S for a very important reason. What are all of her goals? She clearly has strong feelings about discomfort, <clears throat> nausea, anti-nausea, swallowing pills, things like that. She's been sick for a long time. She's been dealing with issues a lot. And so she probably does have strong feelings about different ways of delivering different kinds of care. Another question, I call this the meatloaf question. Anybody, meatloaf the singer? Do anything for love, but I won't do that. Exactly, thank you. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. What are the things that you will not do to achieve those goals? What are your deal breakers? And this was actually a revolutionary question for her because she hadn't thought of it like that before. She thought, I want to get to this. Here's my plan. I'm just going to not do this. And I said, what are the things that you will not do that it's more important for you to not do these things than it is for you to go home? And I said, I want you to think about that and we'll come back and talk about it. And she did, and she was very serious. And she thought, well, maybe the CVC is not a deal breaker. But maybe it is. So we need to think about what are the deal breakers here. Also, offer her complete plans to choose among, recognizing there may not be a curative plan of care that she will accept. <clears throat> the thing that really sucks, and I, that's my big philosophical word for it, sucks, is that we can't fix everything. We can't make everything okay. Sometimes you're going to get a short straw. We can't, the problem is when the teams would come in, they were trying to make everything okay. They were trying to make sure she didn't have any treatment she didn't want, trying to still cure her, trying to do all these things that they could not mutually accommodate. And that's where a lot of their distress was coming from. So as we're thinking about what these complete plans are, we need to think about what are the items that are optional? What are the things that don't affect coherence? that we can kind of negotiate on. She also didn't like taking the vitamins because she thought the vitamins made her nauseous too. So we're like, okay, you don't have to take vitamins. Like, would it be better if you did? Yeah, but we can still, you know, as long as you take the antibiotics, we're good. Work to alleviate patient concerns about problematic plan elements. Do they have pain? Do they have nausea? Can they not swallow pills effectively? What are the things that are actually barriers to them doing the things that they want to refuse? If we can alleviate some of that, maybe they'd be more likely and more comfortable accepting some of those elements to the plan that so far they'd been refusing. Then finally, reiterate the prefix nature of a treatment plan. Once you've kind of come up with these coherent plans <clears throat> and you've de decide, figured out which things are actually critical to the plan that you can't really get rid of, that eliminating them would make it co incoherent, stick with that and just say, you know what, this is what we've got. I've done that with some of the patients, my dysphagia patients. And I've said, your choices are you can eat and be DNR, and we have this plan. You can still get treatment, but if you crash, you've set yourself up for this, and this is where we are. Or we can do the, you can be MPO, we can be full code, we can keep doing these things. But we need to have a plan that makes sense. And th I've been pretty receptive to it. In this case, um, yeah, so this is what we did. Everybody always wants to know what happened. In this case, it was really anticlimactic. We had these wonderful conversations with her about her goals and her deal breakers and whatever. And then <laughs> labs that they had taken two weeks before when she still had her CVC came back negative for her infection. So she was discharged home without us ever getting to this point. We we're waiting for ID to actually come up with plans for us that we could present to her. So it was really anticlimactic, but I was really excited about this part of it. <laughs> that went really well.
So, all right. So that's what I have. Um, I do want to give special thanks to a couple of people. Lauren Dickey, who is my volunteer graduate assistant. She basically came to me and said, can I do work for you? I said, I can't pay you. She said, I'll do it anyway. And I said, all right, yay. So she gets her name on a slide. <laughs> And also to Carolyn Buchanan, who is our newest faculty member at UK, who is also a Kant scholar and really helped me work out a lot of the conceptual issues surrounding Kant, especially. So, any comments, thoughts, questions, issues? Kyle. What about uh, using the Ulysses contracts for these patients? It seemed like that would, the case you just presented was one of the circumstances you might think about that. Yeah, Ulysses contracts are another thing that's on in my world of, of interest in limiting autonomy, like what limits autonomy. So for those of you who don't know, Ulysses, also known as Odysseus, um, was traveling back from the Trojan War and he was traveling past the sirens who sang so beautifully that people would crash their boats against the rocks to get closer. And he told his crew to stuff their ears so that they wouldn't crash the boat. But he said, I want to hear the sirens. Tie me to the mast. And no matter what I say after that, do not let me go until we are past the sirens. Now, how would they know they're past the sirens when all their ears are stopped? I don't, I don't know. It's great literature we're not supposed to ask. <laughs> so the idea for the Ulysses contract is they say, OK, I'm going to sign this contract, but you can't let me out of it later. That's one of the things that kind of comes to a problem. A lot of times when we have that conversation, and we get to deal breakers. And we get to, you have this choice or this choice, and that's where you are. It's amazing how many people actually go with that. I'm kind of surprised that people don't stick to their guns quite as much. Um, I don't really want to look the gift horse in the mouth. But on the other hand, though, we do sometimes have to say, if you continue to refuse, you, for example, your dressing changes when you have burns over 50% of your body, we are going to switch you to a comfort plan of care because we cannot sustain caring for you on this level without providing the necessary care that you need. And so it's not even so much a Ulysses contract because we don't get them to necessarily agree to it. We just say, Look. yeah, it's just like, it's kind of like a patient who just doesn't have other options, right? So how well does that work for legal? Haven't really tried it out yet. Um, but often if you present it to people and you say, look, we have plan A, we have plan B, you can choose A, B, or C, or whatever. These are your choices. They may contain, and you prepare people and you say, you know what, they may contain things you don't like. And that just may be what we have to do to get you to where you want to be. We might not have a choice for you that includes things that you like. Sometimes we have to do the hard stuff. So. It sounds kind of harsh and mean, like it really does. But when you're actually sitting down talking with people, having a conversation about their goals, it doesn't quite come off quite as mean as it sounds right now. So, but yeah, the Ulysses contract, I don't know. I mean, in a way it is, but in a way it's really just a default. Because yes, we're saying if you do, if you do not, we'll agree to let you do this plan. If you don't do the things in the plan. It's really not though, because somebody yeah. has the option of saying, no, I'm done with this plan. Mm -hmm. It's not a Ulysses contract at all because I can, you can sit down and have this lovely conversation with me and I'm like, all right, I don't like these points of it, but I'm going with plan A. Yeah. And then we get to those points and I'm like, you know what, those have just switched from I'm uncomfortable to that's a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. And I'm done. I'm out. Well, the Ulysses part of it is, so you don't get to then just eliminate those parts no, of it. Right. And now I'm out if of you that. don't do this, right. then we put you into this one sure. that you liked even less. Right. And if we come back, so to that's the analogy, Ulysses part. B, C, D, whatever other options mm -hmm. you had. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm willing to consider those that seemed like deal breakers before. Yeah. It just sort of depends on what the situation is. But you're not saying, like, uh, Ulysses contracts get used a lot in psychology, or they used to. Um, yeah. Suicidal. Now they do it with the opioid patient. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and they stopped using them because they really weren't very effective. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question is, what happens if all the plans contain deal breakers? And all of the plans contain deal breakers. And I'm like, you know what? Sometimes life contains hard decisions. Yeah. And you can work with somebody to figure out yeah. why those are deal breakers. You can work on motivation. Yeah. You can work on the competing goals. Maybe that was a deal breaker because. 
I don't have somebody who can help me with the, the aftercare part of that. Mm -hmm. This is going to leave me like that. Yeah. And I don't know what my future looks like. Yeah. No, you're right, yeah. That's a social worker question. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or an ethicist question. We ask all the questions. Yeah. Well, no, like, what do you do next? Is yeah. Before everyone flees, can yeah. I just say, <laughs> let's, let's do it. Can we thank you? Oh. you o'clock, you are right to you. Yes, please. Sleep, but we <laughs> yeah, is anybody in this room after us? Or if anybody else has questions, I'm good. OK. I if this is UK, like 10 minutes till, people would have been like, what's happening? <laughs> Why are you still there? <laughs> they're eating the leftover sandwiches. Oh, they're fine then. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say about this because this is something that's kind of new for us. Yeah. So I guess like under these sort of ideas, how does mental health play into the medical care of the patient? Yeah, so with mental health, I kind of bracketed that off um, because I'm recognizing that the frameworks that we have for thinking through decision making for mental health patients, patients with mental health issues, I don't find them adequate in the best of times. Yeah. And so when we're dealing with these issues where we have these very complicated decision processes, I don't know how to change that, those frameworks that we have. Like I find it problematic that a lot of times when people teach medical students about capacity and mental health and things like that, they say, well, when somebody doesn't have capacity, just think about if they could wake up and suddenly have capacity, what would they say? Right. It's like they're never going to. You know, this isn't somebody who just had a stroke, is probably going to recover to a certain baseline, and we just need to figure out what they would think. These are people who don't have capacity. Right. I mean, these are like 85-year-old people, women, who've lived their whole lives a certain way, and now we're saying we're imposing our idea of rationality on them. Or their capacity of understanding is on a spectrum from day to day. Right. And so exactly. Really yeah, I mean, I'm... That's why I kind of bracketed that out, it was because I don't think we have a good framework for decision making for patients with mental health issues anyway. And so I'd be hesitant to impose something like that. Actually, the patient from Diet Sprite that wanted the Diet Sprite so badly, she was a prisoner. And I was adamant, I'm like, you guys have to come out here and evaluate her because there are all kinds of institutional behaviors and control issues that come along with being in prison for a length of time that can really affect, like if she thinks she has control over this decision, she's going to make it for better or worse. Yeah. So we have to figure out, is she really, like, really that committed to Diet Sprite? Or is she just taking this opportunity, this is the only thing I have control over in my entire life and I'm going to take it. So I, I mean, that, I struggled hardcore with that because I was like, I mean, and then they come in, they're like, oh, she understands she's got capacity. I'm like, time out. There are complicated issues going on here related to mental health that just running through the UR criteria isn't going to solve. But it feeds into your coherence model and the mm -hmm. idea of with the diet sprite, was she really making decisions free of coercion and yeah. outside influences? Right. No, no, she was not. Well, I mean, none of us <laughs> ever are. No. No. I mean, we all exist within a web of social relations that put pressure on the decisions that we make. But incarceration is yeah. more pressure than most of us are yeah. experiencing. Yeah. I mean, family dynamics can be even more pressure than whatever. I mean, I actually have a provision in my advanced directives that says, yeah, I know I wrote all that stuff, but if my mom isn't okay with it, we're not doing it. Like, because I have a higher order value that my mother be okay with whatever happens than that I be okay with what happens. So yeah, so there are all these different complications that go into decision making. And my concern with this was just, I'm like, I would walk into a situation and just see it and be like, this doesn't make any sense. But articulating that and trying to put that within a framework that can ethically justify that intuition was really complicated. And even still, you've left off a yes. lot of the aspects that there are reasons that aren't always rational, like right. family dynamics, right. like relationships, that are not, they don't fall within the Kantian understanding of rationality. Right, right, right. right. Um, but that's part of why I'm trying to, like, w 
And actually, I think this model helps with that, though. Because what I'm saying is whatever your reason is for refusing it, you can refuse it. You can still have capacity. Yeah. You can still be rational and refuse these things or pick and choose or whatever. But simply as a logical construct, as just as a medical logical, con medico logical construct, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Like no matter what you want, what you choose, what you don't, you, we're not going to cure your bacteremia without antibiotics. It's just not going to happen. And so in a way that actually helps that problem because it's, it looks at it and says, look, whatever your reasons are, they might be emotional. They might be, you know, the patient that I talk about, she had a lot of anxiety around that central line. Yeah. I mean, she was to the point where she's like, I can't even stand the thought of it. Because we even were that willing to offer to let her go and get an under general anesthesia. And she was just like, I, the thought of it was so anxious, so anxiety inducing for her. Because she'd had so many of them placed over the years and she hated it. That it was just so hard for her. And I'm like, you know what? That worked. That's a reason. And it doesn't make you incapacitated necessarily. Like some people might say, oh, that's, she's being controlled by anxiety and so she doesn't have capacity. Well, anxiety is a reason. You know, emotions are reasons too. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's really, when it comes down to it, it's one of the things I like about this model is it says, we accept your reasons. And we're not going to judge your motivations, your reasons, your whatever here, except in so far as we need to for capacity to make sure you understand and appreciate all these things. But we're also going to recognize from our side that, look, that's just not effective enough for us to offer it. I do like the fact that you found kind of a, a different concept that helps mm -hmm. explain the tension, right? That's a really useful reframe. Yeah. So let's look at the treatment coherence. We're not looking at... Yeah. Well, so often we're trying to judge somebody's goals or their reasons themselves. Right. So we look at them and we say, previously our solutions to this have been like, well, let's just tell them the reasons are bad. Right, yeah, you're judging <laughs> the individual. Or you have the wrong goal given what you want to do. I'm like, look, you can have all those things. But the reason that we had to do that is because we just don't have any theoretical basis for limiting somebody's autonomy because of outside constraints, right? So like the, an idea of coherence. We just don't have a framework for that. Pre, you know, This is what I'm trying to do is come up with a framework for saying, look, you can have all of that and I don't have to judge your reasons or come in and tell you that you're not making sense or whatever. Well, I might say that. I don't have to come in and say your reasons are bad or anxiety is not a good enough reason or whatever. I can come in and say to you, I get that. No, I'm totally with you. And as a healthcare professional, that's just not something we can offer. We can't make that work for you. So we, don't, we can stop having those conversations about, well, your goals are wrong, your reasons are bad, what's wrong with you, non-compliant patient. Yeah. We can recognize sounds perfectly rational. I recognize you're trying to meet competing goals, trying to attain competing goals. It's just this is not a plan that I can get on board with as a medical professional. Have you had people who then turned and looked at you and went, great, I want you to send me over to that hospital over there? Fine. I'm perfectly fine. If you say, you know what, I can't get the care I want here, maybe I can get it somewhere else. I mean, I'm happy to send you somewhere that you think is more helpful. I, I don't get worked up over transfer. <laughs> no, it just, it kind of, oh. at that point it feels a whole lot like, oh, well, this McDonald's shake machine is out, so I'm going to go over there. Right? <laughs> I had this vision of, all right, fine. Yeah. This is a small disappointment, but yeah, depending That's, on what kind of thing you're looking for. This is a little far afield, but um, I think a lot of that has to do with the relationships we're able to build up with patients. Oh, I don't the team so. had a really strong relationship with this patient. Um, and I was able to kind of get in on that. And when I'd sit down and talk to her, it was clear that she trusted us. And it was clear that we had a good relationship with her. And we weren't sitting there telling her, I can't believe you're, you know, I mean, at a certain point, one of the um, APRNs who knew her well enough that she could say, I can't believe you're doing this. You know, why can't you just let us put it in? And made a lot, we were able to sit down and really have a good conversation. And she was never like, you're just not giving me what I want, I'm leaving. You could tell she wanted to work with us. And when we started talking about what are your deal breakers, you saw a light go on. It's like, I don't even need my whole thing about medical coherence to just ask that question. 
so. Yeah. So it can be really, what I like about this model is that I can stop having that horrible conversation that feels so judgy about your reasons and your goals. You really are giving a lot more respect to their autonomy at that point by saying, all right, you've got your reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of having to talk them out of their reasons, which is what we've spent. I don't know, when was this published? The 70s? What we spent the last 40 years doing. We can actually, I mean, and that's why, that's where my interest in little limits of autonomy comes in. Because I'm like, look, there are things that we don't think we should do. But because we don't have a framework to talk about limits on autonomy, we end up trying to convince people, like, your goals are terrible. That's an unacceptable quality of life, but I have to get you to admit that. You know, there are all these things that we put into place. Like, a lot of these futility stuff comes from that same place. Like, how can we, as a pro medical prof we as a medical profession, the very large we, how can we say we need to stop that? There are limits to what you can, what you can ask and all of that. And that's where this project really comes from. And of course, we're not very good at that, right? Oh, we at suck at it. <laughs> telling people who will not survive a, a resuscitation attempt that, sorry, you can't be full code because there's no point in doing it. Yeah. We don't do that right. So this is, so this is, I mean, the, the, the notion of medical coherence gives the tools to the clinicians to, yeah, to not challenge somebody's reasons, because that's not the point. The point was, okay, but A, yeah. a, a needs to go to B, needs to go to C if we're going to get to D. And if you don't want B, I can't get you there. Yeah. I can get you here, but I can't get you there. And if we can't do that, let's take that plan and scrap it over yeah. here and try another plan. If we can do that, that, that helps a lot. But yeah. I mean, what's interesting, though, is we have to be careful about this whole coherence and futility. I had a slide that I took out that actually had a little overlapping Venn diagram. And then I felt like, ooh, philosophers with a diagram. That's scary. Um, <laughs> be brave. <laughs> be bold. <laughs> I was already scandalous with Kant on one slide. <laughs> Although he appeared later, I know. <laughs> Maybe I did Kant on three slides, but that's still scandalous. Um, but when we talk about futility, we have to be careful because medical coherence is not going to get us that line right. for those medical futility cases. It's not going to get us. So if a patient's in, say, multi-system organ it's failure. It's a different kind of futility. Right. It is futile without this tool. I mean, it's similar to the Jehovah's Witness eh. using a blood transfusion. But it's not futile. We have to be careful with our language. Unless it is. If oh, well, we are can not be. going to be successful in treating this antibiotic, in, in treating these bacterial infections, which turned out not to be there, uh, without antibiotics, yeah. then yeah, we're, that's futile treatment. If you allow yeah. us to give the antibiotics, now it's not futile anymore. Right? It's true. So here's why I want to draw By that way, distinction. I do too. I would be happy with that. I do too. And the burden ratio is any, any other way of saying it. Yeah, so my Venn diagram yeah. it had physiologically futile in the middle. So that is both medically futile and incoherent. But there are all these other things that were medically incoherent, and that's where I get in like the inefficiency, the ineffectiveness. But it doesn't have to zero out. With physically, physiologically futile, it's zeroed out. Yeah. There is no way to achieve that goal. With incoherent, it's just, you know, these, this plane is not going to click. That railroad is, <laughs> that's a really off road. It might get there. Okay, see that, uh, and that's the difference, right? Right, there's the difference. Yeah. Which is why, but this is why I'm saying that this isn't going to help us with our multi-system organ failure patient who wants to be full code. Right. Why isn't it going to? Because that patient has a goal of staying alive as long as possible. Resuscitation can help them achieve that goal. We just don't like it on a quality assessment, but from a point of medical coherence, we're not judging anything about quality. Right. We're not saying, I disagree about your quality of life. We're not saying that goal is the wrong goal for you. We're not saying any of those things. So it's not actually going to justify limiting the autonomy of the patient or family you know, who says, I want full code for this patient who's in multi-system organ failure and is clearly circling the drain. But, so. uh, but a resuscitation could extent like in that case. Right. It's not futile. It could work. Yeah. Well, it, it could be could. medically coherent. <laughs> right? It could work to extend life. Yeah. It's if you want to extend life, we are going to have to re attempt to resuscitate you. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, it's, and that's one of the things I like about this is because anytime we start getting into this murky futility kind of stuff, we start judging people's goals. 
And that gets very, very hard. What I like about this is I'm like, I don't have to judge your goal. I can just tell you, and eh, we're probably not getting there from here. Right. That just doesn't, and it just doesn't make sense. And now I have all this framework and stuff that I can pull out, so I can now walk around saying it just doesn't make sense. When I say, what do you mean by that? I can send them my slides. <laughs> so. <laughs> but don't we also have to ask a question? Like, we're prioritizing not um, questioning someone's reasons or goals to the end that they aren't impinging on other people's reasons or goals. So there was still that question of like, they are they have an extended stay or they're utilizing mm -hmm. resources and they might be okay with that and it might be a, co a coherent medical uh, plan but is there a, is there a point where we still need to say no I think yes so my short answer to that is yes um, the long answer is I think as I do more work on this, I think medical coherence is but one justification for limiting autonomy. There are others. I don't know them yet. Um, I haven't worked through any as much as I've worked through this one. I'm interested in this idea of Ulysses contracts too to say, you know, can somebody sell their future decision making essentially. Um, some of the other issues, um, that are on these limits of autonomy, how much does um, borderline incapacity or mental health issues, how much does that really limit autonomy? We pretend like it just throws it completely out. Well, does it? People have constructed entire lives. And if, we, you know, I kind of have started doing this thing where I've been taking a narrative approach to decision making with them, with patients who have mental health issues, where I'm saying, look, this person right now is kicking and screaming or refusing. They don't want to have, they have a GI bleed. Let's say they're in with a GI bleed, they're 68 years old. Their entire life, it's like, well, they don't have the capacity to make a decision for themselves. It's a pretty easy fix to fix this GI bleed. They're refusing it. It's like, well, let's look at their whole life. So normally what we'd say is, okay, well, we'll have their surrogate decision maker and somebody will make a decision for them and let's hold them down, turn this into a total alien encounter. Like I have patients who come in like, I've been abducted by aliens. I'm like, really, what happened? And people are like, oh, they totally are out of it. They're talking about this time they were abducted by aliens. Well, turns out, you look back at their chart, they had passed out. They were found on the street by an ambulance, brought in. There are all these people in masks and gloves doing things to them that they're asking not to. It's like they probed me. I'm like, yeah, but we do that. <laughs> so it probably is a lot like being abducted by aliens to be brought into a hospital in that situation. Yeah, and that's the narrative that made it make sense. But you have patients who spend their whole lives like refusing treatment, not participating in medical care, trying to just be their own person, be by themselves, whatever, live on the street, who choose to, I mean choose, I always use that with quotation marks for everyone, choose to live on the streets. And now we're saying, oh, you came in with a GI bleed, now we have to get you into a facility and nursing home and this and that and all these things. And it's like, has that person lived their life such that that would make narrative sense? Right. And I haven't worked this out very well yet. But I've been trying to put, kind of apply this and saying, look, maybe we should just let that person refuse. But they're going to die, and it seems like such an easy fix. And it's like, well, First of all, are they going to die or is this something we can monitor that might kind of fix itself? How bad is the bleed? But I think we have to have a pretty strong justification to override that narrative decision. Now, if this is something new for them, they're, you know, it's very different, that doesn't make narrative sense in a way. So I've been kind of working on that too and this idea of how much, so I'm kind of going both ways. On one hand, I'm like, I think some limits we set are really problematic, and those are the ones relating to mental health, incapacity, dementia. On the other hand, I think we don't set enough limits. And some of the ones, ones like, if it doesn't make sense, why are we telling the doctors they gotta do it? I mean, on one hand, it's just like, I should be able to walk into a room and say, you're not gonna get there from here, this is silly, this doesn't even make sense. Like, we had a patient who, for a variety of reasons, she had mesh, there were swallowing problems, whatever. We flat could not feed her. We could not, could not, through any way, get her enough nutrition that she could stay alive. But she wants to be full code. I'm like, what are we gonna do? 
this is, this is the note where I was actually trying, the very first time I tried to make sense of this concept. I'm like, this is a person we absolutely can't feed. We're just gonna bring her back to do it again. How does this make any sense as a plan? We're gonna not feed her. She's gonna code, because that's what you do when you die, because you've not been fed. Then we're gonna try to resuscitate her, so that the very next day she can do the same thing, because we still haven't fed her, and we're not ever gonna be able to. So it just, that's where I started dealing with this. Why can't we just walk in and say, you know what, enough? And I think part of it is because we've gotten this idea. Now, I want to be fair to, you know, you say we're really bad at these conversations, and that's true. But I think it's also true there are a lot of laws that make it very difficult that favor us not putting that limit on. And a lot of lawyers who interpret the laws that we do have that may not be as clear in favor of patients. So I don't think it's necessarily just providers or I don't think it's just legal teams being risk averse or anything like that. I think there's a lot going on there. So, but I think there are other limits to autonomy that we need to think about and there's gotta be something. I, I think that when we talk about futility, we do try to grasp that. There's something there that we're trying to get to. I just think that we've done a really bad job of doing it so far. <laughs> talk in a more informal way as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you guys all for coming and staying and talking.